I grew up here in um, Black Mountain from the age of five. So, so I'm a resident here in, of Black Mountain. As through the years, my race has been called a number of things, names. First, we were Negroes. Then we were colored people. Then we were black. Today, we are called Afro-American. Tonight, I will use the word black. I grew up in the, what is now known as High Top Colony. My father sold the property for High Top Colony to a Mr. Roy John. He, in turn, sold it off in plots to the people who are there now. It, it was a lovely neighborhood in which I grew up. There was only two white families there. We got along wonderful. So in going to school each day, all the children of the community gathered at my father's sister's house and we all went to school in a group. We walked everywhere we went. We walked to school. The white children rode the buses. It was across from where Old Mills Chapel is today. There was what is now known as kindergarten. It was called Prima. One teacher taught from Prima through the seventh grade. When you finish the seventh grade, if your parents could not send you anywhere else, that's all the education you got. And that, that was unfortunate for many in the valley. Finally, a Mr. Willie Fortune, he gave that property to be used for a school for the black children of Craigmont community. We were so happy to have a, another uh, school when they finally built one. So I was grown out of school and my children attended that. And I was president of the PTA at the time and they told us that we cannot furnish a cafeteria because we went over budget in building this school. So the principal said, well, Ms. Doherty, what, what will we do? Said if we could raise the money, we could get our own equipment. I said, we'll raise it. We, we had fundraisers. We've had bake sales and many other fundraisers. We raised $3,500 to equip that school with the stove, refrigerator, and all the equipment. Our school books at first were bought, and then later they were handed down to us secondhand from the white school. Then years, some years later, when uh, our children were told by Asheville that they could come to Stevens Lee High School, but we had to furnish the transportation. Well, there had to be fundraisers to raise the money to buy a bus. We had three black schools in the district. There was one at uh, Swannanor in the Craigmont community and one at Brookside. Some years later they consolidated those three schools and built a, a larger school and I think they had five classrooms there. And today many of our children have come far and uh, I don't know how many of you have been reading the Black Mountain News and seen the articles of progress that some of our children have made, and they're the ones that graduated from Stevens Lee. When I was a child, we could not go to the library and get books. There was a white girl around my age that lived in the community. 
and she would go to the library and get books, bring them to me, and then get my books and bring hers to me. Had it been known that she was doing that, she would have been barred from going to that library. Someone told me, you can now go to the library and get books. I went up and I approached the lady at the desk. She said, what do you want? I said, I came to check out some books. She said, you know you can't check out any books here. I said, I'm sorry, I was told that I could. She said, but you can't. So I said, thank you. I turned and walked away. There was a movie here in Black Mountain. The black people could not go. The only way you could go to that movie or any other movie, you had to be taking care of somebody's child. And we could go to Asheville to the movies. There was only two theaters there that you could go to. The one was the Paramount, you went to the balcony, the other was the plaza. You went from Market Street up a platform into that. You know, they always said Madison County was so brutal and so horrible to black people. A white man approached Papa. He, Papa had four mules. He had five mules, because he had two teams and one single mule. And he said, Bob, everybody called him Bob Moorhead, said, Bob, would you haul something for me over to Madison County? I've never known what it was. And Papa said, yes. My mother was frantic. She said, Robert, please don't go. He said, you know how they say that it is there. He said, well, I'm going. He said, his money looks just as good as anybody else's. So he went. And when he came back the next day at dinner that evening, we have it, he said, I want to tell you children something. He said, I went to Madison County. He said, and I have never ever been treated any better or any finer with anybody than I was with those people. He said, I ate at their table, I slept in their bed, and I was invited back to visit them. He said, I tell you that to let you know you don't judge everybody by a, by a few people. And you could work for people, you could sleep in their bed, 
take care of their children if they were out of town, but you must not go to their front door. We wanted to our black boys to work in the grocery stores. They would not allow that. We boycotted the Winn Dixie in Asheville. They lost so much money until they came to us and said we would hire them, the black boys, on the junior year. We said that's not good enough. We want them hired just like the white boys. You couldn't go to McDonald's. The black boys worked at McDonald's and sold, they sold hamburgers for 15 cents. They worked there, but you couldn't go to McDonald's and buy a hamburger. Woolworths had a lunch room there. And someone said to me, I always wondered why you could go to anywhere in the store and buy what you wanted, and you couldn't go there and buy yourself a sandwich. If you did, you had to carry it out of there. And at Cresses, once a year, they had the high school children clerking in the store. We asked for the black children to do it. Well, we fought for it, we finally got it. And they were very pleased with the performance that our black children did. It was a job opening, and my son-in-law applied for the job. And a friend of my daughter's, who was a secretary like she was, says, I'll tell you something, but don't tell if you do, I'll lose my job. She said, they said that your husband was better qualified from anybody that applied for this job. But we are not going to give it to him because it's too much money to pay to a black man. If you were traveling anywhere and you had to go, regardless of where you were going or how far it was, if you were going to California, New York, anywhere, you sat up on the train. You could not get a berth. Very few black people had cars then, and that was our transportation for years. You had to go to Asheville, you had to ride that train. And if you were driving, through the country and going anywhere, there was absolutely nowhere for you to stop and eat. If you found a city where you could go to a restaurant, they might let you come in and eat in the kitchen, or they might sell it to you and tell you to keep going. And then you had nowhere to spend the night. You couldn't go into the motels, no hotels, unless you got to a city where there were black people who maybe had rooms for rent and then there was a restaurant. You could not go to Mission Hospital or St. Joseph's Hospital. I remember that there was place there, it was a little hospital called Blue Ridge Hospital. The black people could go there, but they couldn't go to the other hospitals. The black people of Asheville and Buncombe County raised money, and that's where our hospital was. I didn't ever see a black doctor back then. And we did have black undertakers in Asheville.
we could not vote. I, I know it was in 42, and one of the ladies that I was working for, she said, Inez, are you voting? I said, no. She said, well, you should be. I said, we can't. She said, yes, you can. So there was a man in our community that was active in community affairs, and I was talking to him about it. He says, oh, yes. He said, I'm carrying people up to the city hall to register, register them to vote. You went up. They gave you something to read. And if you couldn't read it, you did not vote. And of course, it's different today. We have lots of Black Mountain that worked in the, move, in the civil rights movements. I was a housekeeper at In the Oaks during that time. And Dr. King, he used to come there. And he told me, he said, Mrs. Darty, the work that I am in, I know I'm going to die violently and I live prepared to meet my maker at any time. And he did. He flew here, and Andrew Young said, Martin, don't fly. I said, let us drive you. He came for, a, they had a little retreat there. And he said, well, you won't get in rest if it's known that you're in Black Mountain. When he got off the plane in Asheville, a white lady said, good evening, Dr. King. The cat was out of the bag. The next day, that phone was ringing off the hook. The manager said, Inez, you handle it. He says, I'm not going to answer that phone anymore. Five o'clock one afternoon, the sheriff, Harry Clay was a was the sheriff then. He said, Inez, he said, Dr. King is in this community and I'm going to find him. I said, why are you so anxious to find Dr. King? He said, a man like him, people will do things to him. He said, and if I can find him, and I will, I want to protect him. I said, I'll get back to you. So I called the manager. I said, Mr. Goodman. I gave him the message. He said, all right. So he called uh, Harry and told him that King, Dr. King was there. And he sent, uh, security out there. I was working for uh, Mrs. Gladys Azell. They had Azell's drug store. And I made sandwiches for her. I uh, made the filling. And she sold them at the drug store. She came home and she was so angry, she was almost in tears. She said, today, said a group of soldiers came in and there were black boys with them. Well, she said, a friend of hers said, glad you are not going to serve them black boys, are you? She didn't say black, she used the N-word. Mrs. L was offended, she said, I certainly am. She said, Gladys, you can't do it. You'll lose business. She said, so I'll lose business. She said, those boys are going through the same thing that those white boys are going through. And she said, they shed their blood and they're dying for America just like those white boys are. And she said, yes, I'll feed them if I don't sell another thing out of this drugstore. She's very firm about it. It began, I think, during the war because my son, when he was 19 years old, he was under fire in Korea, in the Korean War. And he developed a wonderful relationship, friendships with the soldiers there. They're all one, you're together, you're all fighting for the same thing. And if you, your, your comrade got hurt, if you could help him, you would do it. As you know, Truman was the one that broke up the segregation among the soldiers. He put them all together and they just 
they lived as one. And the integration of schools, that has helped some because some of the children, they have such wonderful friends, white and black. We've made progress in that way, but I'll say this for this community and for the Western North Carolina, you will find <clears throat> a certain relationship between the whites and the blacks here that you are not going to find anywhere else. If you have trouble, sickness, death, or problems in your family, then many white people will come to your age and help you. And we do the same to them.